All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, today's uh, session is about exploring high impact practices and why they are important. Um, so today I've been joined by uh, Dr. Stephen Ellabogan. He's an associate professor in the School of Social Work. Uh, Shane Randall is also here. He's a PhD candidate from the Faculty of Medicine. And Daph Crane is a senior learning instructional designer from CITL. And as I mentioned, my name is Keith Power and I'm an educational developer with CITL. Um, so today I'm just briefly going to go over um, some of the key characteristics of high impact practices, what they are, and you know, maybe give you some clues on how you can actually implement these in your courses. Um, Daph is going to look at it some particular ways of uh, looking at e-portfolios, a type of high impact um, practice. Shane is actually going to describe his experience as a student who's going through, a, who went through a course that he would consider a high impact uh, practice course. And then of course, Dr. Ellen Bogan, he's going to talk about a course that he's designed um, on community service learning and how that would be considered a high impact uh, course for students. So our objectives today are really just to define what are high impact practices. HIP stands for high impact. We're going to look at a couple of different types, um, introduce just the benefits, and then explore ways that you can all incorporate high impact practices into your own teaching and programs of study. So I think that I want to just touch on that for a moment. Um, high impact practices is not something, so just to go back a minute, in this session, we're not going to give you these quick tips or, hey, I can, I can leave this session and I'll be able to do this right away and incorporate it into my class. This session is a lot more about reflecting on how you can change your courses and it takes a bit of time to do this. So you can incorporate it into a class, but you can also incorporate these uh, types of uh, practices into programs. So it's not a quick fix, but it is something to get people thinking about and reflecting on what are high-end practices and how can we actually implement them into our classes and programs. So I already went through a brief uh, overview of what's going to happen. I'm going to introduce it. We'll provide some examples. Uh, Shane will go through his description of being a student and Stephen will provide an overview of his high-impact course. So before we begin, I'm gonna ask everybody to participate in a little tiny activity. Um, I'm gonna ask you on one of your browsers to go to mentimeter.com. And when you get to that page, at the top of the page, it'll ask you for a code. And so I just have the code here. So it's 5590690. Um, you enter in the code at the top of the page and it's going to bring you to uh, a little area where you can enter in five different answers. And what I'm just trying to see here is what people understand about high impact practices right now, what, where their knowledge is. Um, you're just entering single words or maybe a small phrase. You have a 25 uh, letter limit or character limit. So if you could go to that page, I'm gonna share that page with everybody and we will be able to see the answers as they pop up. Uh, the answers are anonymous. Nobody's going to know that uh, who submitted them. But it's just an idea to see what people think of what are high impact practices. So I'm just going to stop this here for a minute. When you go to the page, so the code is there again, 5590690, and you can start putting in your answers. Oh, we've already got an answer. Active, timely, meaningful to students, perfect. We've got reflection, collaborative, experiential. So I hope everybody can see the page and how it's changing and different answers are coming in and we can see what people think of, uh, you know, what are high impact practices, how you would describe them. And there's a lot of great answers here and we're gonna go through. So like coaching, diversity, meaningful to students, faculty student relationships, perfect. So I'll just wait another moment to see if any more answers come in and then we'll just go back to the presentation. So I think as we move through, you'll see a lot of these answers come up. So 
So I'm going to go back here, play from the current slide. So what are high impact practices? So a couple of definitions out there uh, in the literature basically describe high impact practices as being um, educational practices that are included in both curricular and co-curricular experiences. I think that's important too. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the four walls of a classroom. They can happen outside, be very experiential. Um, it's when students engage in novel and innovative environments. And so they're exposed to new ideas. Um, high impact practices also require hands-on integrative and applied collaborative learning experiences. So those are some of the main terms um, that you, we would use to describe high impact practices. Some of the key elements of high impact practices. Um, first of all, it's important that we have high expectations for our students um, and let them know what our expectations are and be clear and explicit about those expectations. High impact practices also require significant investment of time and effort. So it's not a small assess, uh, assignment or it's not even a, a group of small assignments. Um, it has to be something that is done extended period of time and requires a lot of effort on behalf of the students. Also interactions between faculty and their students' peers are also key uh, to learning. Experiences with diversity. So this uh, could mean a couple of different things. One is being introduced to uh, new environments that people are not familiar to. And it can also mean being introduced and working with people that they're not familiar with or not used to working with. Another one is, uh, this one actually came up in our uh, word cloud, is constructive feedback and timely feedback. So students need feedback on a regular basis and it has to continue through the entire process of the learning. They also need opportunities to reflect and integrate the learning. So that's basically taking, you know, the theory that they're learning in class and then applying it in some other way and then reflecting on how they actually applied it and then going back to the theory. And then also learning through real world applications. So that means actually getting out there and doing stuff, um, you know, that are meaningful to the world that we live in. And the last one would be able to have opportunities uh, to basically demonstrate their competence. And I think this is going to come out through uh, Shane and, and Dr. Ellenbogen's uh, presentations and how this was built into their courses um, and became a, a, an important part of that course for them. So here, I just want to list a couple of examples of high impact practices. Uh, we don't have enough time really to go through all these in depth, but we are going to touch on a couple of them. Um, but the first one is first year seminars. Uh, this is something where, you know, you would bring a, small groups of students together and they focus on skill development. It's not really about content knowledge, but more about skill development. That could be thinking critically or developing, uh, you know, information literacy. The next one would be having students engage in learning communities and specifically cross disciplinary groups. So rather than having a whole bunch of students from the science faculty working together, it's great to be able to get students from the science faculty working with students from business, the school of business, or getting them working with people from social work all the way over to medicine and all around. So bringing people together with different um, knowledge backgrounds. We also have writing intensive courses. So you can focus on a single topic, but you're getting students to actually write multiple times for varied audiences. So they're writing about the same thing, but they have to write it again, thinking of a different audience this time and how they would actually write for that audience. Um, undergraduate research. So getting students involved in research. And I think uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan will allude to that. We also have diversity in global learning. And again, this is about intercultural competence um, getting exposed to diverse learning environments and learning from people who are a little bit different than ourselves and being open to new ideas. Um, DAF is gonna talk a little bit about e-portfolios and the need for e-portfolios to focus in on skill development and transferable skills. So getting students to build a portfolio, but again, that reflective piece is really important when they come back and say, okay, you know, I'm including this in my portfolio, but the reason I'm doing it is because it, this represents a skill that I've learned that I can transfer to other environments. The next one we have is service learning. So that's the application of learning. Um, 
in some kind of authentic environment. And again, Dr. Ella Bogan will allude to that. Internships, I think we're all familiar with those, but it's one thing to have students just engage in, uh, in some action. It's important also to get them to reflect back on that action and link the practice to theory. And the last one we have here is a capstone project. So this is at the end of their program where they're bringing together all the things that they've learned through that program and representing it in some manner. Um, an example could be here a, like, sorry, a degree level portfolio. So the portfolio starts from year one and goes right through to year five, uh, sorry, four. And then from there, they're representing how everything that they learned links through that in that portfolio. So why should we be engaging in high impact practices? Well, basically the research has showed us that it's linked to numerous positive outcomes. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail though, detail with those, but we're looking at student engagement, enhanced problem solving capabilities, enhanced uh, analytical skills, the acceptance of new ideas and differing ideas. Also, we got communication skills, collaboration, teamwork, goes on and on. Um, so it has been shown that these type of activities actually lead to students developing the transferable skills that we actually want them to come away with when they actually graduate from university. So what I'm going to lead into is here, I'm going to start with a little tiny uh, activity that you can incorporate into your class. So um, this would be like a class level kind of high impact activity. And so at the beginning of the semester, let's say I'm teaching about student motivation. It's an area that I actually have done a lot of research and, and study myself. <clears throat> so that's why I chose it. Um, so with student motivation, I have several chapters in my course that are looking at student motivation. And what I might actually get students to do is start building a concept map on student motivation. If I look at this concept map here, you can see that I have six different characteristics around student motivation. All of these things should technically enhance student motivation. So students learn about this at the beginning of the course. As they're moving through the course, they start to learn more about student motivation. So they start to realize that interest, student choice and positive feedback actually represent or enhance autonomous forms of motivation. On the other side, we have bonus marks and prizes. These are external and they actually lead to control motivation. They can be positive, but you have to work with them carefully. That's why I have them in yellow. It's kind of like a caution. Um, with the green, that's a yes. Let's do this, let's go with it. So you can see how my concept map is starting to change and I'm starting to make connections between things. I got punishment in red because that's like a basically a no-no, stop. Punishment is not a great way to motivate students. As students move through this concept map, at the end of the semester, they might have something that looks like this. But as they engage in building this concept map at periodic times throughout the semester, I'm going to have them complete written assignments explaining how their concept map has evolved over time. So they're starting from the very beginning and working right through. And as they learn new things, their, their map is changing, but they also have to explain to me how their understanding of motivation has changed through a written assignment attached to this. Or I could get them at the end of the semester to give me a presentation that brings me through their concept maps and then they actually demonstrate their knowledge through those presentations. So these are different ways of getting people to be able to work, you know, through something on a long term basis. From here, um, I'm just going to move to ePortfolios, but I don't I don't see the chat, so I don't know if there's any questions or comments coming in. Uh, Justine, I don't know if you can let me know if there's a comment or a question that I could answer. No, there aren't any. OK, so if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And Justine, if you wouldn't mind just letting us know if you see something. Uh, we can always stop and, and answer any questions that you might have. So that, I'll pass it over to you um, to go with ePortfolios and we'll go on from there. Thank you, Keith. So an ePortfolio is a collection of artifacts that demonstrate abilities and knowledge. So they demonstrate um, a student's 
capabilities that they've learned or had previous experience with that they're now going to take into a new or novel situation. It's a great way for students to demonstrate the attributes of a memorial graduate, and we'll look at those in the next slide. Um, ePortfolio is good at a course level, but it's great at a program level, particularly the professional programs where um, students are moving through as a cohort and they're doing fairly standard courses with some um, electives in there. At Memorial, we use the WordPress platform. And if you look at eportfolio.mun.ca, you'll see um, that all students have access to this and they can log in using their um, Memorial credentials and they can um, create an ePortfolio, whether it's required of them or not. And there's a handbook there for students and, and facilitators, faculty members to guide. Keith, if you'd like to go to the next slide. Sure. Oh, oh I'm gonna go back, there we go. Um, these are the attributes of a memorial graduate. I'm not going to read this to you because I think you're all capable of reading. And this comes from the Teaching and Learning Framework 2023. So Keith, if you'd like to go to the next slide, we have an example of a, an e-portfolio and it comes from the University of Waterloo, I believe. Um, and this particular student has opted to do a video for her e-portfolio. And this is at a course level. So if you'd like to play that, Keith, that'd be awesome. Through doing the Watch TV Reflections, I have come to understand how closely related my math coursework was with developing professional skills that will be used in my future working life. My name is Mandy. I'm a fourth year statistics major in the Faculty of Math. Last spring, for one of my core courses, Statistics 331, we had reflective bonus assignments where we were to reflect on how we demonstrated a professional skill in the classroom setting. So at first, I was really confused as to what was expected of me. This was the first time we were to do a written reflection in a math class. I did my first reflection on personal initiative, and in reflecting about personal initiative, I realized how I could be improving in the class. In the class. Uh, for one thing, I wasn't getting help when I needed to, and as soon as I made this change, I noticed my understanding and marks improved significantly. For the second reflection, I reflected on my problem solving skills. This reflection really helped me understand how the course material tied in with real world applications. As STAT 331 is a very technical course which focuses on linear modeling. However, we weren't just learning about linear modeling in the course, we were learning about how to tackle real world problems. For the third reflection, I did, uh, I did it on leadership. And this reflection, we had to reflect on the group project. For a group project, I encouraged one of my group members who, to do his personal reflection as well. He initially did not want to, but after listening to my advice and the advice of our other group members, he decided to do it. Uh, the three reflections helped me a lot in both improving my marks, understanding the course, and also bridging my understanding between the classroom setting and the real world. A few months later, I was at a job interview where they asked me to talk, talk about how a time where I developed a professional skill. So I was able to take my answers straight out of my second reflection on problem solving. 
My interviewer was so impressed with the connection I made between my coursework and problem solving that I got the job. So this total um, e-portfolio was done by video. The um, platform that we use is WordPress and students can integrate a video into um, the platform. They can present everything by video. They can use text as well as images and um, audio, video, that sort of thing. So um, it's, you know, neat portfolio is well worth looking into. I'm going to pass this over to um, Shane now. Just one moment here. I'm trying to, oh, there we go. Perfect. All right, Shane, um, unless there's any questions, I'm not sure again, just uh, you're seeing if you can let me know if there's anything in the chat, if anybody has anything that they'd like to add. Uh, there's nothing in the chat. Okay, perfect. Right. Shane, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, hi, my name is Shane Randall. I'm a PhD candidate in the uh, CLINEPI program over in the Faculty of Medicine. It's on the Division of Community, um, Community Health and Humanities. Uh, and I'm here today to speak about a program offered to graduate students at Memorial that I was lucky enough to take last year. Um, and I think it's a great example uh, of a program here at Mund that incorporates a lot of the features that um, Keith and Daphne were talking about uh, with respect to high impact practices. Uh, so the program is a Teaching Skills Enhancement Program, or TSIP. Um, and for anyone who wants to follow up with uh, with this program and learn more about it after the talk. I put the website there just at the bottom of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. So as the name um, suggests, the Teaching Skills Enhancement Program is all about um, instilling and developing and progressing your teaching skills, um, no matter what level you're at. For me, for example, when I started um, this program, I had zero, zero teaching experience and I still have relatively little, <laughs> but I do um, accredit this course with actually changing my mind from thinking I didn't really want to incorporate teaching into my future career plans to absolutely wanting to incorporate it into my future uh, career plans. And uh, basically it is an intensive and longitudinal program uh, spanning two semesters. And just to note, when I did it, um, I started in the fall semester 2019 uh, into winter semester last year. So say for uh, 30 minutes worth of lecturing, I was able to complete this program in uh, uh, in person before the COVID-19 restrictions came down last, uh, last spring. So basically this program uh, will take you the full academic year um, broken into two semesters. The first semester focuses more on uh, in-class um, sessions uh, where you will be reading articles, discussing articles from the previous class and partaking in group activities with uh, classmates in the class. Um, as well as in the first semester towards the beginning of that semester, even if you have no experience, um, it's required for you to write down at least your general ideas of what you think would make your teaching philosophy statement. And for those I'm familiar with them. Um, oh, sorry, I think the slide just changed. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, no worries. What's an online session without glitches? <laughs> uh, so anyways, for those unaware, teaching philosophy statement is a document that's going to incorporate uh, your thoughts and your the tools that you might use in your teaching, um, or methodologies you might pull from and, and why you think they're important. Uh, and at first it was pretty scary for me as a student because I was like, oh my gosh, what do I, I have no idea what to say here. But the instructor um, who was, Full disclosure, Miss Daphne Crane, uh, she's phenomenal. Uh, she was really good at explaining to us that this was something to just get our thoughts wherever we are at um, in our careers down on paper. And this is something that we keep going back to over the course of the whole program to update and fine tune. And it's, you know, you're getting feedback from the instructor as well as your teaching mentor, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, so it is a very iterative process over time and something that's meant to be developed over a longer period of time, again, full academic year. Uh, 
Uh, and in this first semester, again, you're going to reach out to a potential mentor, most likely an undergraduate professor, um, which you'll have an internship with in the second semester. So moving on to the winter semester, we still have in class sessions, or at least you know when I when I did it, it was in class sessions, uh, but only four of them, and that was great because it kept us all engaged and kept us all uh, getting together on a regular basis, but also allowed for more time for the internship portion of the program. So during this time, you would meet regularly with your teaching mentor. Uh, for me, it was Dr. Margaret Caldwell, uh, a biology professor, as that was my undergraduate degree. Um, and uh, with her, I observed her mentoring, sorry, I, I observed my mentor teaching herself uh, before I ever got up in front of the class, which was a great experience. Uh, and then at the end of the semester, the main deliverable was a teaching dossier, which would include your fine tuned and finalized, I guess, teaching philosophy statement, at least at that point. Um, and again, you would have opportunities to keep revisiting and developing these uh, these pieces over the course of both semesters with feedback from your instructor. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm just going to touch on some of the key elements of high impact practices that uh, Dr. Power mentioned above. Uh, so as I just said, TSEPT uh, is a multi-component program spanning two semesters. So you are getting a significant investment over an extended period of time. And again, the teaching philosophy statement, as well as the, the main deliverable, the dossier, uh, were meant to be worked on uh, cyclically, cyclically over the course of the semester, uh, both semesters, so that by the end, your, your final product is something that a lot of time and effort has gotten into, and you can rest assured that it's it's going to reflect all that you've learned over the course of the two semesters. Next slide, please. Alrighty, so interactions with faculty and peers. Um, as I said, the first semester, there's a lot of uh, in-class uh, components to the course. You have your weekly in-class sessions as well as online discussions between those classes. So there's this constant interaction between students, but done so in such a way that it can fit quite nicely with most schedules. Um, and of course, my peers in the class were from a bunch of different backgrounds, not just academically, but culturally and experience-based, um, different ages. It was a great blend of students for sure. Uh, and communication and camaraderie were fostered and encouraged between the students, uh, again, with group activities and online discussions. So we were always bouncing ideas from each other and learning from each other and with each other at the same time. Um, some of the in-class uh, activities could include something such as mind mapping, for example, where we'd take some of the methods that we learned in articles from the previous class and try to pull, try to find out and pull out different tools from those articles um, in a group, to, uh, group setting. And in the second semester, um, interactions with your mentor is vital, and uh, this allows for great learning opportunities, both in the lecture theater and outside of the lecture theater before you ever get in front of an actual class. Uh, next slide, please. Alrighty, and again, speaking on diversity. Uh, so in my experience, I came from the Faculty of Medicine. Um, but there were peers in that class from chemistry, biochemistry. Uh, one young one fellow was from um, communication technology, and I, I remember I knew nothing about his topic, so I found myself very drawn into listening to his uh, his ideas because it was so new and fresh, and it kept me very invigorated. It was something exciting to look forward to um, when you'd interact with the students each week. Um, so it's a great opportunity too to see what's going on outside of your departmental bubble. Uh, it's, it's a great way to get the students first hand view of of research that's going on or any programs that you might not have been aware of. Uh, and also another arm of diversity, just the overall comprehensive and multiple component uh, blending of methods that were used um, kept things very diverse. And again, that's the online discussions, the in class components, different activities and a major project that you're meant to work on over the course of both semesters. Um, as well as, of course, the ultimate teaching in, uh, in, the, in the second semester. Next slide, please. Alrighty, and this is very important, I think, to the whole process. Frequent, timely, and constructive feedback. So, as I said, the TSIP instructor for me when I went through the program was Ms. Crane. 
and uh, I found her to be very kind and respectful and very importantly she responded to emails quite quite frequently and timely as well as offering you know in-person opportunities just after class to speak or in class if you had any concerns uh, and offered um, adequate office hours for those students who wanted to have one-on-one -on -one private conversations uh, and I found that with the online discussions um, it was very important to note that the instructor always gave feedback to every student. There was no student comment left behind. Uh, even if it was a, you know, a good job, those are great points. Um, or if it included constructive feedback, um, every, every time a student posted, there was always something to go back and, you know, see there was an acknowledgement that that was, that was read and understood. Um, and then of course, with your internship in the second semester, uh, in my experience, Dr. Caldwell was just fantastic at communication and, we work very well with each other to develop what I what topics I would cover in the biology courses um, that my lectures uh, occurred in. And I think that for students looking for mentors, once they find a suitable mentor and they they come to an agreement, those those instructors who are agreeing to be mentors are likely to be very good at again speaking with the students and providing the constructive feedback because they're agreeing to volunteer with the student at the beginning anyways. So I find that uh, most of the mentors and the other students I spoke to said the same. They enjoyed, uh, they really enjoyed that aspect of the course as well and developed a really good relationship and rapport with their mentors. Next slide, please. And I think I'm just getting to the end of mine. This might be my last slide there. Uh, so opportunities to discover relevance and learning through real world applications. Uh, this is where actual lecturing comes in after much preparation. Uh, so again, during your internship, you will prepare and deliver three hours of lecture as agreed upon with your mentor. Um, again, I, I got through two and a half hours of mine and unfortunately, I was really excited to give my last one and I couldn't do it in person uh, because the class at that point had, uh, had gone, gone to online. Um, but more importantly, you get to observe your mentor delivering lectures before you ever get up in front of the class. So by the time, you know, the curtains come up and it's show time for your lecture, uh, for me, at least I felt completely prepared and comfortable because I had watched my mentor, I had learned from my mentor and we had talked, you know, back and forth many times and compared our slides and made sure everything was good to go before you ever, ever actually gets up in front of the class. Uh, and another cool option, I guess, cool, uh, for me, it was kind of awkward watching myself, kind of cringy, <laughs> but most lecture theaters, and now, of course, with everything online, most of these uh, seminar platforms can allow you to record yourself, and then it's a great opportunity to watch yourself as the students would see you and give yourself some constructive <laughs> feedback after you get over the awkwardness of it, if you're like me. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to talk about. Um, I, I think that the TSEP program is definitely a worthwhile venture for any graduate student that wants to improve or gain teaching experience. And I think it incorporates uh, multiple high impact practices that Dr. Power mentioned above. And I will wrap it up there. Thank you so much. So just give me one moment here, please. I'm just going to uh, switch presentations. And we're going to pass it over to Dr. Ellen Bogan. So, uh, here we go. Stephen, can you see that and everything's okay? Yeah, I can see it fine. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about is um, something that took place over a number of years. Um, and um, probably a, it would be easier to talk about it as a cascade of ideas that took over, took place over a number of years. So, I had an idea. I applied it, that worked well, and then from that experience, a new idea came forward, a more complex project until I arrived at what I'm going to be presenting today, which is all of it. So it started basically with, um, I guess, an innovation that I don't think I would consider a high impact practice, but certainly a good way of delivering a research course for social work students um, who, according to a lot of textbooks, are not the biggest fans of research. Um, so, my concern was, how do I make it more interesting for them, more relevant for them? 
So um, I had used to teach it in other ways, but I thought it might be more interesting to have them actually create research summaries and to learn about research by um, unpacking research methodology, but also um, get interest because they're actually summarizing research in an area that's of interest to them. And um, considering and then expressing the implications to social work, practice, policy, education, advocacy, uh, etc. So to really consider the relevance of research findings. Um, and from that, I thought, well, wouldn't that be a good idea um, to have the students actually apply these skills in the real world? So um, in, the, in the following year, and this is a couple of years later, of course, but in the following year of their education after taking the research course, um, I have them go out into the community and offer their services um, to summarize a research in an area of interest to the community organizations. Uh, of the community organization, sorry. Um, so that's what they did. And this isn't a community development course. So I thought that was a good kind of learning experience uh, or a good way to understand community development as well by actually going out into community organizations and, and kind of interacting with them and also doing a project in their interest. Uh, at the same time, um, the community organization um, agrees to uh, to receive an interview or to, to be interviewed and then the students also do another assignment that's related to understanding the organization and understanding its place within the, you know, the theories and concepts of a community development course. Um, so uh, uh, students are a little more nervous about that. Um, but they did it and they found it was a wonderful experience. They like going out into the community. They like this idea that their project is going to be more than just an assignment that sits in a shelf or sits in their computer or whatever, um, that it's actually going to serve a purpose. And so that motivates them um, to, um, to do the best they can on this particular assignment. Um, and I thought that was a great idea. We've been doing that for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, and I've interested other in, uh, instructors, including all the instructors in our department who teach community development. So all the students who um, go through our uh, bachelor's program actually um, do this community service learning activity and have been doing it for several years now. Um, and from that, I thought, well, that's an interesting experience, but wouldn't it even be more interesting to actually have them refine their projects and really get immersed in the scholarly process? Um, and so I applied for some funding um, from the uh, Office of Public Engagement Accelerator Grant. I got accepted. And so what we did, and hired Keith, <laughs> by the way, um, what we did was um, had the student selected or selected students projects that seem to have a lot of potential. Um, and we invite them to actually refine their uh, summaries and present it in a conference. Um, and so we want them to do this in partnership with the community organization they originally work for. So we try to kind of get everybody on the same uh, everybody in agreement and then the project starts and that's called that we call the scale up project. And the conference we created ourselves, so it was called Exchange 2018. Um, and it worked out uh, quite well too. I mean, there are challenges with respect to all of those activities, but at the end of the day, uh, they created very strong summaries and summaries that were of interest to the community, uh, both the community organization and other people. Um, we also posted them online, so we got a good indication of how interesting the summaries were. Um, and, and from that, there was a couple of small spin-offs, so some of the stronger summaries actually uh, got published in professional publications. Um, and from that, I thought, well, that's a great idea. Why don't we try to take it, or why don't we try to do it again, but take it one step further? And this time, we actually selected a smaller number of projects. Um, so the first time, well, actually, I can, I'll have this, the numbers later on, but I selected a smaller number of, of projects. Um, and then makes the presentation at a conference basically just a waypoint in the process of this project. So they're refining their research summaries, but more towards um, very often an application for funding to do research on the very topic that they originally discussed in their initial assignment. Because the assignment 
you know, a community organization, they go to a community organization, you know, I'm going to offer to do a research summary for you. So typically it's something that is of interest to them. And typically there is a natural research question that comes out of those summaries. And so we, we picked a, a few projects and that what, that's what they did. Uh, so we applied for funding. Um, and I think we, you know, some of them were ongoing projects. Some of them were new projects. Um, but they were successful in um, receiving research funding, and these became, you know, research projects that involved the, the faculty, the students, and graduate students as well. I should point out that the refining of, uh, in the previous step uh, scale up projects also involved graduate students. So we were bringing in people and we were helping with their own kind of development of skills because the, the mentors. Who mentor these students are typically graduate students so it's giving them an opportunity as well um and so that's where we're at it now where well, they presented at exchange 2020 um and that was a little bit more i guess professional as far as conferences go we also invited other faculty who are doing community service learning or other kind of high high impact activities um, that involve students, that involve like training students or preparing students for the real world. Um, and, and so it was a great conference and then there was COVID, so everything shut down, but we're still working on um, two research activities, a publication a peer -reviewed comp uh, the, in a peer-reviewed publication. Um, so it, it's been working, it's worked out quite well. And so that previous slide just kind of gives you an idea of the student benefits. Um, are, are we still in that? No, we're, uh, we're back. <laughs> yeah, go back to the students. Uh, that's two, uh, two back, I think. Oh, no, that's it, eh? Yeah, no, uh, goal students. One back. There we go. So, um, yeah, just very briefly, and you can read it yourself, you can see that it really is about increasing their readiness for graduate school and developing skills. Uh, in knowledge mobilization, which they can use also in their workplace, in addition to for their own professional development. So the students get something from it. And then if we move to the next slide, you'll see that the CBOs or the community-based organizations, well, they get a summary uh, in a topic that's of interest to them. And very often this is something that they don't have access to. Um, community organizations, um, you know, they don't have the people to do it. Sometimes they don't possess the skill set, and very often they don't have access to uh, libraries of publication where students do. Um, so they get that, um, and then they get to actually work on a scale-up project. So some of, them, some of them actually become active participants in the refining of knowledge. And then in the last project, well, they're actually getting to um, conduct or co-participate or, or co-investigate research questions that are of interest to them, um, in addition to, you know, being successful in grant applications and publications, um, which I think could be quite interesting for a lot of CBOs. Uh, and in the next slide, I think I talk about what's in it for the uh, mentors, so that's the, and the faculty as well. And I, I think that shouldn't be discounted as well. Um, the School of Social Work, like in many places, we come from away. Uh, we don't, we're not from here. So what happens is I end up knowing a lot about not only the uh, many of the topics that are of interest, because all these research summaries are on a different topic, uh, but I also end up learning a lot about the organizations and networking or and developing networks with all these community based organizations and they end up knowing me as well. So it just creates this, this space for this exchange um, that creates new opportunities, both within this scale up community service learning project and outside of it as well. Uh, so we're building partnerships. And I think that increases my skills uh, in service learning and instruction. It broadens my research knowledge uh, and it broadens my research agenda because these projects, of course, I'm very often an investigator or co-investigator uh, on these research projects, even though, you know, as much as possible, I try to delegate uh, work to the students, to graduate students um, and others. So that uh, in a nutshell is, um, what I've been doing, uh, at least with respect to uh, high impact teaching uh, or high impact practices. Um, I think there's a couple of other slides. One is on the numbers. 
in case you're interested, if you can get to the, oh yeah, oh, a brief slide just to show you that um, the first two activities, the community service learning course um, doesn't require funding. And quite honestly, I don't feel it's an imposition upon me. I think it might be a little bit more work, but I haven't really noticed it, neither of other instructors. It's just designed in such a way that a lot of the things that could be taken place, could be done by someone else, is being done by someone else. I don't contact the organizations, the students do. Uh, I don't do a lot of organization for it. Uh, the community-based organization does that because they know what they want uh, and they're certainly capable of telling the students what they want. Uh, and so I don't feel like it's much more complicated uh, once you, you know, you master it and you learn how to do it and you build your, um, you build your syllabus and everything and have done it a couple of times. I think it just becomes a very manageable course. Um, anything beyond that, of course, does require funding and then we are talking about, you know, additional investments. So I think that's what. Um, I like about this project is it starts from a place that doesn't seem unwieldy and then you can just slowly build in these extra components um you know and when you have time which is very often a concern for instructors because we are being pulled you know in five six different directions so in the next slide i think we have um some numbers so there's five instructors that are employing the Supple Community Service Learning, um, or have. So the, the ones who are teaching community development, and then a graduate student of, uh, of mine is now using that same process in Yukon College. Uh, and in many ways is more successful. It's almost like the smaller and, um, and more Northern, or, <laughs> or maybe, I don't know what Northern, but it, at least more small community. Um, the, the place is, the more likely this is going to be successful. At least that's what it seems because their students have even have done kind of the same thing. And in many ways, they're informing policy. Um, so they're almost like one step ahead. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily that we're doing a worse job. It's just that the community is really gung ho on supporting this. Uh, and it's just that, you know, a place like Yukon um, is like that. They're more likely to do that. So it's almost a different reality. Um, since the conference, uh, I think I estimated there was about 225 students who participated in community service learning in the course. Uh, 32 students participated in the scale up projects and, and presented at a conference in one way or another. Um, and the community partners in all these projects, I estimate to be about 49, which is probably a good number of all you know, almost all of the ones in the Avalon Peninsula, or, you know, give or take, or probably about half of them. So I think a lot of people are aware of that. In terms of accomplishments, um, so I posted online the 2018 um, papers, and I, I put that on ResearchGate, and there was already, um, within a year, there were 600 people that already viewed those papers, which is quite impressive. Um, so there seems to be a, a, an interest in the international community in this kind of project and in these kinds of summaries. Um, in terms of the 2020 exchange, um, there's going to be one submission for peer review uh, publication. I will be developing an online repository that's kind of in process. Uh, there has been two, I think, possibly three successful grant applications related to that. Um, and it's all it developed the opportunity for research assistant work and a lot of culinary benefits. Um, in terms of uh, the grants to, to um, achieve these um, projects, I, I managed to successfully achieve four grants uh, in public engagement and one research grant. Um, and one of those public engagement grants was a SHRP grant. And in terms of the, the students, early indicators are that this is really helping them in terms of prepar preparing for um, uh, entering grad school. And I know that at least two participants, one or two participants um, in the project or in one of these courses um, has already successfully achieved a, or successfully received a SHRP fellowship fellowship and is you know, pursuing graduate school now. Whether they're getting, you know, they're interested in taking uh, the graduate program earlier, I don't know, but I, I think there's 
you know, definitely uh, the opportunity, or I think, uh, you know, I think there should be, a, a, you know, I should be doing research on this and actually looking at the outcomes. Um, so that's probably what, what I'm looking at um, in the near future. There will be a couple of small slides, uh, reflection slides. So, um, yeah, in the conference, we talked a little bit about the experiences. I think relationship building, when you're doing community service learning, it's almost like one of the key themes that comes out, not only in my experience, but in some of the other panel discussants as well, uh, that it can't be rushed. Um, and that um, at least in community based research, um, everybody knows their role and I think it makes relationship building a little easier when everybody has these clear roles and everyone can feel like they're an expert in something. Um, and I think what's important in mind is that the students initiate um, um, the process so they become, you know, they develop not only expertise, but a certain degree of confidence because they're placed in the center of this role and not placed in the back end you know, where often it's the faculty or some experts going to set up the community service learning experience and then they come in later, uh, which is a little bit more of a passive process. Um, in, in, chat, in class check ins for this kind of activity is really important. Um, and also going into a scale up project, it does require a lot of adjustments because the roles and the players are changing and you have to think fast and you have to bring in people to replace the students who are leaving. So there's a little bit more complexity once you get into these uh, scale up projects. Um, yeah, and also alliance, collegiality, accommodation, I think the longer the project goes on, the more those things are important. I think the last thing is sustain sustainability. Um, so in the short term, I think, you know, the SCS cell, the, the course, I think, is a sustainable impact, uh, high impact um, project. The scale up projects might not be, or they might be when the, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say um, whether in the long term, but I, I think that even though something might not be sustainable, like some of these projects are meant to end. So I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, uh, and to, to think that we need to prop this up and we need to have a project following this project. I, I think there's room for things uh, that just provide an experience to students and then people move on to the next thing in their lives. Um, and if that's the case, if it, you know, sustainability is not what we're looking for, right? you can look at the quality of work, uh, are students pursuing graduate study or other kinds of activities where they're going to be exercising their research skills? Um, you know, have you involved the community as co-investigators? Um, you know, were you successful in what you've achieved, whether they're funding applications or something else? Uh, and also growth. I mean, did the individuals grow in some way? I think is a really important indicator. Um, yeah, and that's about it for me. And I think we're coming to an end, so I will leave uh, some time to wrap things up. There we go. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. All right. Um, what we'd like to do at this point in time is open it up for some questions. We don't have a lot of time, but uh, you're more than uh, welcome to type in your questions or unmute yourself um, and ask questions to any of us, and we'd be happy to engage with you in conversation. Keith, I don't think my dance uh, routine is going to be required after all. <clears throat> no, I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I don't see any questions coming into the chat. Um, what I would like to say is that if anybody would like to talk about high impact practices, they're interested in engaging in, a, in this any type of uh, practice or learning more about it, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to myself uh, or Daphne, and we can actually then, uh, you know, uh, set up some meetings with you, talk about it, um, try and help you with any resources that you may need. Um, so please feel free to uh, reach out. Perfect. Thank you very much, Keith. Thanks, Keith.
Thank you, everyone. I think we will uh, bring the session to a close. Thank <laughs> you.